It's difficult for young Pacific people to imagine the world that our parents built. You know, they arrived in New Zealand that was dominated by Pākehā people that had very few institutions for our people. Run to the battle, run to the end. Rugby, historically, has been one of the few places where Pacific people were on a, literally on an even playing field. They had physical qualities of speed and power and that just seemed to be an advance of a lot of European and other cultures. When we grew up, we just uh, taped the bottle of coke or tape or coconut uh, as in, and play around with it. That's how we got those skills. Us as Pacific Islands, that, that's something that we love to do. We love to get that ball, the agility, the speed, the power. I mean, we were built for this game. So I was selected on the 1970 tour to South Africa as one of the first four players of coloured extraction, uh, for want of a better term, to be allowed to go to South Africa. So they gave us the title of honorary whites. You know, we, we weren't honorary whites. We were proud to be representing our own heritage. And to actually have a Pacific person on TV was so unusual in those days of really monochrome, just black and white, but just white <laughs> presenters on TV. So to see Brian Williams there was just incredibly exciting for all of us to see someone who was like us. And as kids, when you're playing in the playground or you're playing outside on the lawn and you're saying, oh, who you want to be? I'm going to be this. I'm going to... Well, guess who I wanted to be? I wanted to be Brian Williams. Even the, the Māori kids, <laughs> it was BG Williams. I think they all claimed him to be Māori. We didn't mind that. Um, we were happy to share BG with, with the rest of Aotearoa. He just captured our imagination and he was the inspiration. If BG could do it as a Polynesian, um, we could all do it. What has impacted the game the most has been obviously when rugby went from amateur into the professional era. We were like, wow, this is like Christmas. Because we, you know, for so long we had just been getting such a minimal allowance. I mean, we didn't know ourselves in the sense that, you know, one minute you're making not minimal wage, but it wasn't much higher to being some of the highest paid Kiwis around. When I started, uh, you know, in 95 at the Warriors, I was one of the first wave of guys that or went straight from school into the environment. Uh, before then, a lot of the guys were working, so they had jobs and stuff, so we were sort of like the first wave that didn't work, you know, as such. So that big transition to professional rugby introduced new physical standards, and so what you see almost immediately in that transition is the size of players involved undergoes a massive change, and not just their size, but also their physical abilities. Players are coming out fitter, faster, stronger. When I see some of our young men, Pacific Island men today, I'm kind of thinking, as in looking at 16, 17 year olds, I'm thinking in my mind, when I was 16, 17, how would I have been able to try and tackle that, you know? These players produce the industry. Without these players, there's no industry. And yet, they have no say in the game. We're pushing on 50% Pacific Island representation within the whole of the NRL. But if you look across the board in terms of not only coaching, management at all levels of education and well-being, you'll be lucky to find any Pacific Island people from these places. When I walked into the office first day of the NRL, I was the only brown guy in the office. And in the office we might have had about 100 people in there. For me it was like a realisation that we're overrepresented in the sports field and in our, our capacities to make teams and you know be on the field and do all this sort of stuff. But behind the scenes, you know, we, we were sort of invisible. And you know, quite often most of the, especially in rugby, most of the people in positions of power are from the Pakiha dynasty as such. When you look at the, a lot of the Pacifica, you know, it's all about God, it's all about faith and that um, it's not so much about materialistic things. So what I get, I share. Some of those beliefs are very foreign to Pakiha way of doing things. When you get players from these communities that all of a sudden are earning more than, you know, mum and dad and uncle and auntie and the next door neighbours put together, then a lot of times there's an expectation that this person uh, has to contribute more because they have more and so they're often investing their money in churches and extended family and their family living in Tonga or Samoa. It's very difficult as a young man to say no to people who you love and care about when money is seen as a way of showing love and care. So there is a huge amount of responsibility on these players. 
when you play high level sport, whether it be rugby, whether it be league, whether it be netball, whether it be softball, any of those sports, you know, you enter an arena, you enter a space where there's high pressure. Somewhere along the line, you're gonna have a bad game. <laughs> you know what I mean? And somewhere along the line, someone's gonna jump on social media and say, you're useless. You know, oh, you can't tackle, oh, you can't pass, you can't do this, you know. And it's probably going to be in the papers and it might be on the TV as well. You know, somewhere along the line you're going to encounter these challenges. You play at the highest level, you're, you're, you're top of all top, and then you drop at the bottom end of the pit. So that's a huge jump between them, it's, you know, so there's a massive motion ride, which means that at one point, man, if you can't handle it, you're going to go keep going down, right? NRL star Reni Matua has pleaded not guilty to assaulting a taxi driver following a night out in King's Cross. I was probably someone that never found the balance of my social life and my professional life. Eventually my social life definitely took over my professional life. The one and only time that I took recreational drugs whilst I was playing, I tested positive six days later to a steroid that was cut into recreational drugs. Now, how do you explain that to your father or your mother or your family, you know? That still hurts me today that I had to sit out of the game for two years, especially, especially how it affected dad. It hurt dad bad and that still affects me to this day. That was probably the toughest thing I had to deal with was what I, how, what I put my family through. When I was at the Warriors and we had just lost the game, we are having a really bad season and I was walking back into the tunnels after the game and I hear people just calling out, you're an effing drunk and you're, you know, you useless piece of blah 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 and I'm looking up and the person that's calling out right next to them is my mum. Yeah, like that's the stuff that you really struggle with. You can do all the negative comments and abuse at me but when my family's around and stuff that's always tough. When I finished playing, they offered me a role in the NRL, in education and wellbeing. And I said to them, what's that? And they went, well, it's basically working with players in their life off the field, uh, helping them make the most of the opportunities, not just the Pacific guys, but, you know, all the players. And I said, what do we do for the Pacific boys? And they said, uh, nothing. Or nothing specific, you know. They're just part of everything that we do. And they said, do you think we need something? And I said, yeah. And they went, okay, cool, set it up. You know, so for me it was an opportunity to not just help our Pacific players grow uh, across the game and set up specific programs to empower them, but at the same time help educate the NRL and educate the system on Pacific people, Pacific athletes, Pacific communities, Pacific mentality. I tell guys, you know, look, if there is any necessarily own peers, just go and talk to someone. Let it all out and then you're starting to hopefully together come up with solutions and then effectively you actually do come up with the answers because you start talking and talking and then it goes bing, the light comes up and goes, okay, I get it. Thinking back of what I've achieved in here in New Zealand on the rugby field, there's a lot of memories and especially in this ground here and Eden Park and where I played for the Blues and the first try for the All Blacks and that's the great memories. The history and heritage of the game inspires young New Zealanders, certainly as far as the All Blacks are concerned, and we want it to be, you know, the best we possibly could be and enhance that All Black history and heritage. Now see as Brian Williams inspired us to achieving it to the highest level, I realised as I turned to look back and say, well, what can I do? Who can I inspire? A lot of our hearts, particularly the guys who have come from that generation where we've seen so much, but we want to ensure that the next generation are better than us and, and that they're more successful than us. And that's, that's really what motivates a lot of us to do what we do.